Hello everyone. I would like to welcome all of you for the another chapter of CIM Trend Chat. Uh, today we are going to discuss the recent report from uh, EMA Consulting um, on CIMA called Responsible Solution for Creative Positive Consumer Experience. Uh, we have two experts in our panel today. Uh, Steve Barson, a Managing Director of EMA Consulting, and also Prabhas Sirivardhana. Uh, He's a technical staff member at DevRev and also a well-known author in identity-related areas. Um, so before we start, I would like to remind you that uh, we are running a QA and answer session at the end. Uh, so you can raise your question with our expert panel at any time. There is a QA chat box visible in the bottom of your use screen. So you can raise your question as we move along and we will uh, take them at the end. And also um, for the, all the participants of this webinar, you will receive a complimentary copy of uh, the, um, the survey report. Uh, this is a very comprehensive and in detail report uh, based on a recent survey carried out among more than 200 business organization who have uh, around 50,000 uh, consumers. So I will suggest you to take a look. Uh, the report uh, will be uh, with you right after this uh, session. So uh, without further ado, let's get started. Uh, first, Steve, uh, would you mind giving us a brief introduction and what's your role in CIA? I would be delighted to do that. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me to, to talk about it. Uh, the research that you mentioned actually is uh, research that, uh, that I uh, led the team to conduct. I am an IT industry analyst with Enterprise Management Associates. Basically what we do, if you're not familiar with, the, with uh, analyst firms, is we provide, uh, we conduct primary research on topics related to uh, IT. In, in our case, we focus on IT management solutions and uh, we provide guidance to uh, consumer audiences or, or businesses on uh, what solutions they should be adopting and what best practices they should be Im uh, implementing. We also provide uh, guidance to the vendor solution providers on, on what uh, organizations are looking for in particular areas of um, uh, disciplines. And, and uh, my particular focus is around topics related to identity management, identity security, including the breadth, uh, consumer identity and access management, which is what we'll be talking about today, as well as privileged access management and general uh, enterprise uh, identity and access management, which is supporting workforces. Um, that's me in a nutshell. I've been doing this for a very long time. Before that, I was 20 years in IT engineering management support for large Fortune 500 companies. So I've lived in the trenches and I've felt all the pain. And uh, for the last uh, 17 years or so, I've been uh, talking about it. Yeah, thanks, Steve. That's a good overview. And looking forward to get deep into to your report today. Excellent. Uh, Prabhat, would you also like to give us a brief introduction and your role? Sure, yeah. Uh, uh, thanks, Agar and WC2 for having me. Uh, so yeah, I'm working at a company called DevRev now. Uh, I'm part of the DevRev identity. Uh, DevRev, we are building a, a Dev CRM, uh, which is trying to uh, bring customers closer to the developer or get the customer feedback uh, directly to the uh, developer. And uh, before that, uh, I was with WSO2 for like uh, almost 14 years and led the product, WSO2 identity the product vision and uh, the developer, yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. Okay, uh, so I would like to start with a traditional but very valid question, security versus convenience. And we have been told to balance the security and convenience. This effectively means we have to compromise both up to some level. That's not ideal, right? Still, can we achieve both security and convenience at the same time without compromising. Boy, you, you dive right into the big questions, don't you? Because yeah. uh, and I'm actually glad you started here because it, it gives me an opportunity to sort of 
uh, clarify some misconceptions uh, that are out there in in terms of consumer identity and access management. By the way, I, I want to. Uh, we often use the term SIAM, C I A M, and I just want to be clear when I say SIAM, I'm not talking about the country. I am talking about uh, consumer identity and access management. Um, uh, so balancing uh, security uh, and convenience. Now, when we talk about convenience here. Uh, my presumption is we're talking about consumer experiences, uh, how they're, how easy it is for them to use uh, the resources that are being offered by the business. And uh, you can't understate the importance of that component. Uh, when we look at uh, enterprise IAM, which is for employees, the focus tends to be on security. That's the, the business core of identity and access management is around ensuring the security, but it's just the opposite in the SIAM field. In SIAM, the focus tends to be on convenience or on improving user experiences, and there's really good reasons for that. 96% of uh, unhappy customers never complain, but instead leave and never come back to offered IT services, 96%, if they are unhappy with the experiences that they're receiving. Um, and even worse than that, one dissatisfied customer will tell another 15 other people about their experience. So uh, with this in mind, many businesses will err to the side of caution, uh, putting their security at risk um, by offering low friction or uh, more convenience uh, solutions, uh, easier to use platforms. Um, and, and this is where I want to get into this sort of this misconception, this idea that security and convenience are diametrically opposed forces. Uh, the idea, the, the misconception is that as you increase security, you decrease convenience. And the opposite, as you increase convenience, you're actually decreasing security. Um, and, and in fact, the latter is, is where this mentality comes from. Okay, we'll sacrifice security by increasing convenience in order to drive better profitability with the services that we are offering. But the truth is, is that the two are, are not diametrically opposed forces. They're independent forces, except that they are linked together. This is very interesting because our research shows that as you improve convenience to the end user, you are actually increasing security. I know that sounds contradictory to, to the general conceptions here, but think about it. When uh, users, any user, is approached with a, uh, a service that they like to use that is not inhibiting their productivity, their performance, uh, that is more convenient for them to use, they're more likely, more likely to use that service as opposed to trying to bypass those services using unsecure practices. Uh, for example, um, a user might, uh, if they were approached with a high security solution, let's say it's password based, they may share that password with their friends and family. That's unsecure. They may use passwords for multiple accounts. That's unsecure, right? These are poor practices that they're doing to get around these complex, high friction environments. Now, to be clear, when I use the term friction, we are talking about the number of steps and the complexity of the steps necessary to access resources or to utilize those resources. That's friction for the end user. And um, our research actually showed that if you create low friction authentication processes, um, it, it, it actually boosts across the board, it boosts security effectiveness. For example, uh, we found that um, low friction authentication processes reduce instances of unauthorized users accessing business applications by 58%. And it reduces the number of successful phishing attacks by 62%. It also reduces the number of users sharing business data with unauthorized users by 75%. These are huge reductions in breach events uh, just by introducing low friction authentication processes. Again, because your, your, your consumers are now working with you to achieve security. Um, and, and that's really the key. So the answer is yes, you can absolutely uh, achieve security and convenience simultaneously, but you need to do both. Uh, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about that, Prabhat. I mean, are you, uh, with your the folks that you're working with, are you seeing, um, uh, the interest in doing both? Are you seeing more of an emphasis on the convenience side? And how are you advising them to, to get to this sort of balance? 
No, I, I think I think you are you are exactly right. Uh, so you laid a very good foundation. Uh, so yes, so finding the right balance between uh, the security and convenience doesn't necessarily mean uh, that you need to compromise either. Finding the right balance means you need to find the right usable security. So if you make uh, the security harder, so that would mean, as you rightly said, people will try to find shortcuts. For example, if you make the password com policy very complex, what would happen? People will write down the password. Right? So that basically, like that's not the objective of having a strong password policy. I can give one good example. So there's a nice, uh, very good book by uh, Matt Bishop uh, called Computer, Computer Security uh, Art and Science. So there he talk about uh, the principle of psychological acceptability, uh, which says the, the security measures that we enforce to protect a resource should not make uh, the, the user experience uh, much worse than if there's no security. Right? So that's right. what the, the principle of uh, the psychological acceptability means. So that, so, that really like explains what we want to do. Uh, uh, so that's why now we see people are moving away from complex part password policies and rely on more usable MFA options. Right. So, uh, so it's it's something that uh, it's it's a progressive thing. It it happens in in phases. Like so, we started with FIDO two, right? So FIDO two with some USB stick. Now we don't need to use a USB stick. So we just touch the, the, the key on, the, on your MacBook, right? So we have the phone apps, so which will do passwordless authentication. So mm -hmm. that's where we are finding the right balance. It doesn't compromise your security, but still it increases usability. So yes, so it's a, it's a misconception. If you think like you need to take down, you need to find the right balance, I mean you need to like take down security to improve the user experience, that's wrong. What you need to do is you need to find the right, right level of security based on your audience. Yeah, so that's that's what I can see on that. Yeah, yeah it, you know, it's interesting you bring that up because also, uh, you know, we're seeing broad changes in the perceptions about the delivery of low friction authentication in specific in the industry. You look at um, uh, the, the the new NIST requirements that were actually issued in, in 2018 or 2019, um, which uh, actually says that you shouldn't be forcing users to change passwords on a regular basis, creating these high friction authentication uh, unless it has been detected that that password has been compromised, right? You're creating these low friction because that improves security. You look at also uh, the executive order that came out on zero trust um, in uh, uh, January of this year. This, this is focused on uh, uh, certainly government institutions, um, but, uh, but the general idea is that uh, to enable uh, zero trust today, um, they should be using low friction authentication processes, passwordless authentication in particular. They need to be moving more in that direction because that actually increases security. So this isn't just me saying this. I think this is a broad industry recognition that we move to, need to move in that direction. Yeah, thanks. I think you both really covered this uh, first question. Um, so moving on. So, so another interesting uh, finding in your survey is that uh, the survey revealed that identification of users with malicious intent as most challenging aspect. Why this is so important and also why is this so challenging? So I, I would like to know. So let's start with Steve again. Well, roughly 65% of businesses experience a, a major security breach each year, according to the research finding. Uh, that includes malware infections, stolen credentials, and exposures of uh, sensitive consumer information, like their contact information or credit card numbers. This is, this is big information you don't want to lose as a company. That's 65%. Each year, that's a huge number of breach events that are happening. What even worse is that 94% um, of the organizations that experience a breach event reported severe consequences to their business as a result. Uh, just to dive into that a little bit, uh, we found that uh, the, the research results found that 35% uh, of uh, the businesses that had been breached that we surveyed, they reported lost revenue. 35%, 36% reported lost customers, 38% reported damage to company reputation, and 40% failed to meet regulatory compliance. These are, these are not small issues. These are big issues, big consequences to the business for not achieving 
uh, uh, security requirements. And it's interesting, as I mentioned, I also cover enterprise identity and access man management, and these numbers are much higher than we find in enterprise IAM. And that's because of what I said earlier, this, this focus on convenience over security, they're willing to sacrifice their security unnecessarily, but they, they tend to do that. And that's why these numbers are um, significantly higher. Now, unfortunately, to your, to your point about uh, identifying users with malicious intent, now, um, uh, uh, that particular issue, um, identifying users with malicious intent was identified by our survey respondents as being the most difficult SIAM practice with 58% reporting it to be very or extremely challenging to their organization. That's, that's huge. They, they recognize the problem, but they don't know how to solve it. Um, so the second part of your question was, how do you do it without criminalizing loyal customers? Obviously you don't wanna sacrifice those consumer experiences. And, um, is the big answer to that question, but, but to sort of narrow it down, a, a big component of this is to introduce something called contextual awareness, which is understanding the context of the uh, access in order to determine levels of risk with that access, right? Uh, and there are a number of things you look at when you look, you look at the devices, you look at the networks that they're talking over, you look at the resources, the sensitivity of the resources being accessed, like if they're providing credit card information, that kinds of things. Um, and, uh, but more, most importantly, you wanna look at the behaviors of the users. In fact, of all the elements in a contextual awareness solution in, in SIAM, uh, our research showed that um, the identification of user behaviors is the most effective at reducing breach events and policy violations. So, um, and so what do I mean by that? So user behaviors are uh, regular activities that the users do. They, they usually access these resources or perform them in a particular way. It also talks about um, if they are doing things that um, are questionable activities or if conditions on their device um, are, are questionable, uh, which may lead you to believe that this is not, that, that the person actually punching in the, uh, the keyboard there is not the actual person who owns that account. And this gets to the, the core of your question, which is identifying the users with malicious intent. Users who are either not the users who they're supposed to be, or they are users who they're supposed to be, but they're doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And by monitoring their behaviors is the most effective method of identifying whether or not they are uh, the appropriate person doing the appropriate thing. Yeah, cool. And Tabat, so... Uh, let me ask a slightly uh, different question. Um, so I think uh, as Steve covered, so this is a very tricky challenge, right? And also there are two aspects to consider. One is that we should not criminalize or harm, make harm to your loyal customers because that business lose the most valuable assets. And also when it comes to this uh, behavior and uh, identifying, analyze user behaviors, we are in a very tricky area of privacy, right? So what kind of a technology, so what kind of a architectural solution are there to overcome this kind of a challenges? Sure, yeah, uh, just to add uh, what Steve mentioned. So yeah, so uh, in the traditional uh, authentication mechanism uh, with, with an IDP, the federated identity model, uh, what we see is like, uh, so there are SAS IDPs, on-prem IDPs, so we redirect the user for authentication at the IDP. Then user comes back. Either you can enforce MFA or adaptive authentication at the IDP. But uh, that is not just enough. So the, the other layer that you need to enforce or have from uh, the application uh, point of view is the continuous authentication. Right? So that like so having having right level of machine learning, AI and behavior analytics will help to understand the user more, understand the user pattern more, patterns more, and then like enforce the level of authentication you need to do, right? So that'll help like to, to separate out users with malicious intent from the legitimate users, right? So then you are not going to like enforce a higher level of security for your legitimate users. But whenever you see there's a violation of a policy you set, uh, that the risk level is increasing, then you can enforce additional level of authentication. So that's the continuous authentication. Uh, the, 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 
the CIM, uh, CIM vendors can provide part of that, but however, uh, the businesses, they should think about enforcing uh, the continuous authentication. So, so what's the, what's the other part of the question, Sagar? Uh, I, I think you're pretty much covered. What I asked was like uh, the, the technological solution or- but In the, terms of privacy, right? In terms of privacy. Yeah, privacy, yeah, yes. other part is the privacy. That's also- Yeah, yeah. so that's, that's, a, that's a bigger, huge concern uh because so if you look at uh so when you when you like so if you want to uh, enforce these policies very much accurately uh you need to learn more about these users right so you need to collect a lot of information about these users so this information can be the information that you directly collect, collect or the information that you derive or you some information you find by 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 research about the public information available regarding these users. Right? So now when you collect this, you, the information, like uh, you, you will keep this information at different places, right? Now the question is like, if you take GDPR, CCPA and different other privacy regulations, so they do, they do have like this right to be forgotten. So if some user requests uh, uh, their information to be deleted or wiped off from the system, so we should respect that. But how to do that if the user's personal information scattered across multiple places, right? So there we can think about like, so there are different techniques. So one is like, we can create a pseudonym, right? But but one second, it's very challenging because if you take GDPR, like even, even if you remove, like you, you create a pseudonym for all the users and record all the users like interaction patterns against their pseudonym and and you link that pseudonym to users' personal identifiers uh, at some at some like one single place. When user requests to delete the user's information, you break the link. Then we expect the information to be anonymous. But still, uh, things can be tricky. Like even you, if you take GDPR for example, someone can take your anonymous record, and and if if they can find the corresponding uh, records like public records and link those together and still you can identify the user then still still you are violating gdpr so it's it's a little tricky so we see like a lot of saas vendors coming to help uh, help uh, in this domain to uh, to to store users data still still uh, preserve their privacy yeah it's a very it's a very tricky thing to do yeah yeah thanks i know i know this is a very uh, this is a very deep subject we needed a separate um, yeah. chat or separate session for that to discuss. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so moving on. Uh, so as a company at WSO2, we believe users should have freedom to decide their deployment option, whether it could be on-premise, uh, private cloud, public cloud, multi-cloud or hybrid cloud. And it's quite interesting to me that the survey also suggests the organization that adopt hybrid SAM solution achieve higher success rate, less number of data breach. Still, can you elaborate more on this finding? Yeah, it. it uh, I mean, it was it was very clear that um, uh, there were uh, broad areas of improvement uh, around um, their satisfaction uh, when adopting uh, hybrid-based solutions, um, both in the cloud and on-premise. Now, I, I just want to be clear what we're talking about here. Um, this is uh, organizations typically adopt a hybrid solution to help with that balance of security and convenience. Um, by um, by storing um, the most sensitive information on premises rather than up in a in a public cloud. Uh, in in a typical hybrid scenario, the management platform itself sits in a cloud in a public cloud. That's the management console that the administrators would be accessing and con to configure the environment. But the actual data that's being collected sits on premise. Um, and by doing that, you can protect the data better on premise. Um, it also, and this is another big piece, uh, a lot of organizations utilize on premises resources, proprietary resources that they have, either they've built in house or that they've uh, purchased from a third party platform and introduced in house on premises. And that's really hard to integrate 
with a public cloud solution. You have to build a, a bridge to make all that work. If you have a hybrid solution, it makes it a lot easier because you can, you can just do all that locally on premise and then allow the platform uh, to, to do that, uh, the heavy lifting of the, the integration components between on-prem and, and off-prem. Um, so that's actually a big uh, component as well. And what I mean by that for the on-premise solution you may have things like a, uh, a CMS, uh, a, a, cust a customer management system, for example, that you may have on, or a database that you may have on premises. So uh, making those integration points becomes much easier. So the satisfaction rates go up. Hybrid cloud adopters um, were also noted in our research to achieve significantly higher increases in consumer registration rates, very specifically since adoption. Um, uh, we also know, <clears throat> excuse me, we also noted that, uh, and, and I think this is actually related to that, hybrid uh, solutions were most likely to employ progressive profiling. Um, so, you know, I, I think that there's a definite uh, relationship there, uh, progressive profiling, uh, the ability to systematically collect information over a period of uh, sessions rather than all at once is actually more conducive to uh, uh, enabling consumer registrations because right up front, they're only being presented with a very simple set of information to collect like just an email address. So it makes things a lot easier. But we, we definitely found there was a correlation. Organizations that were doing progressive profiling were more frequently doing it um, with a hybrid solution. Uh, and and uh, my suspicion on this is because the orchestration for it uh, is, is easier to manage uh, on premises by uh, managing the profiles on premise rather than uh, managing them up in the cloud. So having that, that hybrid environment makes it easier for that. Um, additionally, respondents with hybrid architectures were most likely to report their environment is highly scalable. Scalability is so important in SIAM. Uh, according to 68% uh, of our respondents um, had reported that the solution had been architected to rapidly meet expanding uh, uh, requirements to expand dramatically uh, to meet unexpected growth. Um, with hybrid solutions as opposed to uh, solutions that are on-prem or only in the cloud. And adopters of hybrid cloud solutions were most frequently noted uh, that uh, consumer credentials and information was more secure. So this goes back to um, uh, the fact that the data is now sitting on-premise rather than out into the cloud. And finally, hybrid architectures were, were noted uh, to be the least likely to be infected by malware. Um, again, because you, you have that logical separation, you can put them inside. We don't talk about perimeters anymore, but when in, in the case of hybrid, we are talking about creating a perimeter with inside the on-premises business for hosting the most sensitive information in your SIAM solution. So um, we, we see significant reductions in malware infections uh, for organizations that have a hybrid solution. Yeah, uh, let me let me add a little more to that, Sagar. Uh, so the way I see the hybrid cloud is, so when you <coughs> when we define hybrid cloud, we say the public cloud and then uh, on prem. So what I see today, so that may be true for many of the large enterprises that exist today who are not born in the cloud, right? So they have a lot of legacy stuff running. So hybrid solutions like having some component running in the cloud and then some agent running and on prem to bridge those together will work for them. But most of the new companies, most of the PLG companies, which are born in the cloud, so they directly work with the cloud. For them, hybrid means like the ownership, right? So new on-prem is a cloud itself, right? So it's not like no one, uh, like, so my understanding is no one will like any new company, they will not run any like their private data centers. So they will start everything on cloud, right? So then, then your question can go to a different angle. So there can be a different view. So here, rather saying like hybrid, so hybrid would really mean build versus buy argument too. And so if you take a CIM vendor, right? So my on-prem is the components that I build myself, right? Which I have more control. I can do whatever I want. So I'm running on public cloud. I'm running on Azure or on AWS. Then I'll pick my CIM vendor, that's a SaaS vendor, but I will not completely like uh, have everything from the CIM vendor. So I'll build my part too, right? So that's what I see. So most of the CIM solutions, right? 
we cannot expect 100% of the requirements to be addressed by most of the CIM vendors out there. So we need to build some stuff. And that build part is the one which will bring you the computer advantage or all the others, right? So that's what even at DevRay, what we do. So we have a CIM vendor, we have a pick, but we have limited, limited dependency on that CIM vendor. So there's a major part, like, so we are building a dev CRM, which is once again, very much similar to like the CIM at large scale. So we need to know our customers well, we need to identify the relationship. So we have a larger part we implement on-prem in the sense, it's, it's on-prem means it's under our control, but still running in the cloud. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. In fact, uh, you established the foundation for my next question. Uh, so, so there are, as I said, there are some important factors to when searching for a CMS solution, right? Whether, uh, whether you're buying it from a vendor, whether you build it. So two of them are really critical, the extensibility and customizability. Right. Uh, so what would you think about these two factors when you're searching for a CIM solution? Uh, Pabat, start. Yeah, please. sure. Yeah, I think extensibility is key. Uh, uh, so if you look at Sagar, even WC2, uh, identity server, the extensibility is one of the key things. So if you take uh, uh, like WC2 customers, I would say 90% of WC2 customers, uh, they have extended product. And that is that is not just WSO2 identity server. That's that's a very common common thing in the identity domain too. So I have looked into other IDPs, the other identity providers, other vendors. So they are also they claim like 95 percent of customers they have extended product in in some way. Right? So that is what we see in CIM. So there's a common common set of requirements most of the customers need. So any CIM product out there they should address that common thing. But then again, each customers based on the domain they are in, their, require, their, 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 their customer base, they, they may have their own unique stuff. So the CIM platform that you pick, whether it is on-prem or, or, or a SaaS, it, has, it should have the extensibility, right? So once again, with extensibility, the other factor is how much developer focused, right? So if the product is extensible, but it is not developer focused, then it doesn't really match. If it is extensible, it should like it should let developers extend it, right? So having sort of APIs, having like the web hooks, uh, so those stuff. And and another another thing is it has to be part of your like you need to be integrate things with your CI/CD pipeline, right? So that's where we see that even even at DevRel, so we are we 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 have a CIM vendor. At the evaluation phase, we log into the management console and uh, complete everything right by hand. Uh, through the management console. So after that, we don't need to log into that console. What we need to do is we need to automate everything, right? So we need to, we are following the GitOps principle, right? So any configuration change. So whenever we are introducing, a, when we are registering an application, right? And or else when we, when we define like uh, some extensions, we build extensions, we need to go through the, the, the CSD pipeline has to be reviewed and should be versioned and with one once the PR is merged, it has to be deployed to the corresponding uh, service. So API support should be there. So I think, yes, so extensibility is, is one, one key thing like uh, all the CIM vendors should support. And I believe there's a lot of room for improvement for most of the CIM vendors out there to get there and make these products developer focused. Yeah. yeah, let me dive in. Let me dive in on your question because you also asked, yeah. uh, you know, what what things you should look for when adopting a science solution in terms of extensibility and customizability, oh. and yeah. uh, and to break them back and to sort of break those into to two pieces. Uh, when you talk about extensibility, as Prabhat was 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 mentioning, it, it's all about integration, right? It's about enabling ease of integration, and there are actually two different kinds of integration. Uh, you can look at direct and indirect. Direct integration is an integrations that are built into the platform. Uh, they are in integrations with third-party products, say, for example, like ServiceNow, for example, if you wanted to integrate directly with uh, ServiceNow or, or a CMS or something like that. You want those built in with the platform. They're the easiest to do, right? You don't have to build anything. It's just you just connect it, maybe set a few configuration parameters, and you're, you're good to go. Um, the second type is building an API for anything that isn't built in. Obviously no solution can cr create direct integrations with every existing product in the universe. 
So you want to have a, a rich set of APIs to build those integrations. So those are features you're going to be looking at, the number of direct integrations that conform to your environment, and also a rich set of APIs for extensibility. Now, when it comes to custom, customization of the platform, uh, you're really talking about uh, designing the user experience, right? You want to be able to customize that user experience for your business requirements. Uh, we talked about progressive profiling earlier, and I think that's one, certainly one good area you want to be able to orchestrate your progressive profiling. Um, the other things like uh, uh, orchestrating user consent, acquiring the user consent. Basically, during the entire uh, consumer journey, as they're accessing your IT resources, you want to design an environment that is going to be favorable to them, right? That's going to make the that's going to make the experience really positive for them. So those orchestration capabilities are very important. And uh, when we talk about orchestration capabilities. Um, often businesses build these themselves. They may use scripting techniques. They may, uh, you know, uh, 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 build these using custom code. Um, but having a platform that's drag and drop, low code, no code, that kind of thing, that's an easy to use method for orchestrating these end user experiences greatly simplify customizing the SIAM solution for your business. Yeah. Thanks. That's a good uh, overview. Um, so scalability. Scalability is another important criteria. Uh, and I, I would like to pay special attention to scalability. In an example scenario, an organization may have deployed a workforce identity solution. And they may think, can I extend this solution to cater my consumers? Right? Because most of the time, if you look at this, the basic foundation technology like O2, OpenID, Kinect, Hall and uh, role mapping and the uh, rollback access control, these are common, right? But when it comes to scalability, we are talking about entirely two different set of requirement. So what would you think about that, uh, Steve? Uh, yeah, uh, it's a very good point. I think um, it's one of the key differences between consumer identity and access management and enterprise identity and access management. And, and really we're talking about numbers here, right? I mean, there's a finite number of employees in a business. And your business may grow, but you're not going to see, you know, it's just orders of magnitude growth in the number of employees in your business. But you will see them, hopefully, in your consumer engagements, right? So the number of consumers will grow exponentially. Uh, with the number of employees, you're talking thousands of employees. When you're talking uh, about uh, SIAM solutions or consumers, you're talking hundreds of thousands, millions, or even a billion. I mean, you're, you're pretty much topping out at a billion. I think Facebook has over a billion customers right now. So, uh, so that would probably be the high end for a SIAM solution. But you're talking huge numbers. The other big important thing to, to recognize is how rapidly it can change. With an enterprise IAM solution and employees, it's, a, it's sort of a steady growth, right? The business is, is growing at a steady rate. So you're increasing the number of users over a long period of time. With SIAM, you get spikes, right? You think about it. If you're having a sale event, suppose you're doing retail and you're having a sale event, suddenly you have an, a, a huge increase in the number of customers accessing your site or seasonal events, Christmas time for many uh, retail organizations are gonna get a larger flood of consumers during that time period. So you need to be able to have a solution that can scale rapidly, not over a long period of time. Uh, this, is, this is where cloud really comes uh, in, in, in handy here, um, even if you have a hybrid solution where you're trying to keep all the stuff on premise, you can still cloud burst. So, uh, because how fast can you spin up a new server on your environment, right? I mean, there's, there are limits to how fast you can grow on your on-premise solution. Whereas in the cloud, it's, it's the illusion of infinite scalability. So you can always take advantage of that. Um, one other point I'll make on this um, is the opposite, the importance of elasticity. Um, so we talk about, often talk about the, the, the expansive growth you need in SIAM, but there's also contraction. Uh, periodically, you know, people log into accounts once and then never show up again. And uh, periodically, you're going to want to purge those accounts. And when those accounts purge, you're going to reduce the size of your uh, consumer uh, uh, data. 
or you consume the number of your consumer accounts. Well, you don't have to be paying for uh, additional storage services or uh, resources for managing accounts that nobody's actually using, right? So you want to be able to contract the size of your environment as well as increase them uh, in order to uh, maximize your cost savings with uh, your infrastructure. Yeah, that's a really yeah. good point. I think in addition to that, these abundant accounts increase your vulnerability vector as well. Right? A, right. Yeah. Uh, Let so me give one on. example, Sagar. I think Steve uh, highlighted a very important point, like spikes in, in CIM solutions with respect to the, uh, the workforce IA. So uh, I, I have a concrete example from my WS2 experience. So we worked with a customer in the financial finance domain, right? So their average, <coughs> Average uh, peak load, average, the, the peak load uh, for uh, for like 28 days of the month, right, is around less than 50, 50 login requests per minute, right, uh, for 28 days. For two days in the month, it goes from less than 50 to 3,000 plus, right. So those are the paydays. So people will log into the bank to check whether the, the payment has arrived, right? So this is a very common that. thing, right? So there's a huge difference between like, you cannot like, so if you build this on-prem, right? Even though you have, you can have auto-scaling of course, right? If you don't have auto-scaling, you cannot provision your resources to 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 uh, address this peak load, like 3,500 requests per minute, which only happens two days per month, only a few hours, right? So that is why, as you correctly said, uh, Steve, like uh, this auto scaling uh, elasticity is, is quite important. That's why people will once again rather having this infra infrastructure, even like it can be something you build, but still you will rely on uh, platforms like Kubernetes and and go for like hosted platforms on, in Azure or uh, AWS. Uh, and from developer experience, I, what I can say, so this 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 the access patterns is one thing, right? uh the load uh, for cim solution is one thing other one other one is user base right so uh, one criteria we had while picking a cim solution was we wanted like so we are building a solution which is b2b and then b2b2c right so mm -hmm. in our b2b b2b scenario we want we want to scale to 1 million organizations right and then b2b2c scenario we want to scale to 1 billion customers right so those are the requirements we see in the cim domain yeah, good, thanks. Uh, so moving to another area of the report. Steve, 68% yeah. of respondents think their CM solutions are in place are not uh, are inadequate, mm -hmm. right? So this is 68%, not a simple yeah. number. In fact, I was surprised to see this number. What do you think? Is it just a bare perception or is it real? Okay, so uh, let, first of all, let me quantify that number. Um, specifically, the 68% is referring to the number of respondents who noted they are planning to enhance or replace their current SIAM solution because they are not meeting their needs. So that's a little, little different than ge generally uh, you know, having inadequate. With, why that's important is because what it means is, is that they did not properly architect their environment. And I totally believe this, right? So when they purchased the initial Siam platform, they purchased it to meet the requirements that they had at that time. And it seemed like it would satisfy those requirements, but they didn't take into account future requirements. And uh, what's happened is, is that uh, they're in a position right now where the only way they can resolve this uh, dilemma is to enhance or, or rip and replace their entire environment. Um, we talked about scalability. This is a earlier, and, and, and certainly that's a big piece of it. Uh, a business may introduce a SIAM solution again, to meet the scales they expected at that day, then maybe they grow you know, tremendously, which is great for the company, but it's grown beyond the capabilities of the SIAM platform to support. So it is no longer adequate to supporting that environment. Uh, but additionally, it's, it's also business requirements are changing all the time. Uh, I think another great example that we're really, I'm seeing like this quite frequently today, 
Uh, we went through a period uh, over the last couple of years where the focus has been around enabling two-factor authentication. Everybody should be familiar with this by now. Every website you go to, uh, you have to uh, go to your, your, your phone and um, you have you know one of two ways. You could either get a, a, um, a one-time password on your phone using SMS or on your email address, and then you enter that, um, that one-time password in as a second factor of authentication, or you get a push notification where you can click on on it and then get approval for your authentication. The, the truth, the reality of the matter is though that uh, both options are still high friction because you're adding another level of actions that the end user needs to perform in order to access your services. And it hasn't, it has proven not to be very favorable with uh, the consumer audience out there. There's a lot of pushback against uh, using these high friction two-factor authentication processes. So what a lot, of, a lot of businesses are doing today is reassessing their SIAM solutions to look for alternatives uh, to high friction solutions, um, even though they had invested in, in one of those um, types of approaches, they want a new solution that deals with multi-factor authentication, passwordless authentication that isn't as impactful to the end users just because the whole industry is evolving. Um, and then finally, the other area that I would point is security issues. Um, a SIAM solution sounds great, you know, you implement it, and then you're one of the, uh, the majority of businesses out there that are getting hit by a major breach. Now, what do you do? You, you got to go back and close that hole, right? It's been impactful to the business, your CEO is on your back, so you need to adopt a solution that's going to uh, fix that security problem. So that would also create dissatisfaction. So I absolutely believe with the 68% um, uh, uh, a statistic that, that suggests that they're unhappy with their existing solution. But again, that's not to say that they weren't happy when they first adopted it. I think they just didn't plan ahead. Yeah, I think uh, in bottom line, that's a good uh, uh, a good view to have because they they, they, they recognize it as a, in a decree. So there's room to improve and the, right, like that. Uh, so Prabhat, so what's your view on that? Yes. So I think what I learned from Steve is like inadequate here is like, uh, uh, like uh, unhappy, right? So uh, yeah, so I think that's a different perception. I, I, I would agree. But then again, like if you if you go back to our previous uh, point in with, with respect to the extensibility of a CIM platform, right? So what I see in the industry is like, uh, most of if you take most of these CIM vendors, at least 90 90 percent of the customers they have extended the platform right so that that indirectly mean right none of those CIM platforms can 100 percent accommodate the requirements that's totally fine right because you see a lot of like unique requirements coming so the bottom line is like when you pick a CIM vendor right so may like be careful like uh, uh, not to not to pick a CIM vendor just based on the requirements you have today. You need to think about the future, right? The CIM domain, as Steve rightly said, the requirements vary a lot, right? So when you when you build when you build a company, right? When you build a solution, you know you, you will have an idea like what to build, but you will know exactly what you need to build once you get the customers you learn a lot from the customers, right? So that will change the direction of the solution you build and that will change your requirements, right? So keep that in mind when you pick a CIM vendor. So, so you need to make sure that the CIM vendor you pick, the platform is accessible and, uh, and, and, and developer focus. That's, that's one key thing that you can extend it to accommodate your changing requirements. I think, yeah. So I, I agree with that, with that number, yeah. Okay, cool. So as we are reaching the end of this chat, I would like to finish with uh, one open-ended questions. So this is about uh, the emergency of B2B identity. So B2B identity means a, a business access another business. And also uh, we can see a, another uh, form that is uh, B2B to C, which means a consumers of one business organization access another uh, capabilities of another business organization. For example, uh, so there are some uh, taxi services that facilitate their users to order meals from the restaurants. So these are like a complex 
business uh, scenarios uh, when it comes to identity. Uh, so what would you think? Uh, would uh, B2B identity become more prominent in future? Uh, so let's start with uh, Steve. Uh, do I think uh, B2B will become more prominent? Um, it, it, it's difficult to say, um, uh, more prominent than it is today. Well, when we talked about B2B, I mean, what you're primarily talking about is the business um, uh, creating uh, relationships with partners and supply chain, right? Um, so, uh, you know, are we looking at an increase in the number of partners and an increase in the supply chain? Um, from that perspective, I don't see substantial growth. What I do see substantial growth in is requirements around B2B. Most organizations are actually using the same solutions they're using for B2C for their B2B, which is just awful. There are major differences between B2B and B2C. With uh, um, uh, B2B, with, with uh, business to consumer, uh, you, obviously, you're, you're, tr you're trying to fish in a, you know, grab as many fish you can from the pond, right? So you cast a wide net and try to grab as many consumers as you can. With B2B, it's much more targeted. Um, a B2B uh, engagement requires a close relationship between the two businesses. Um, there's uh, going to be a smaller number of clients that in a B2B engagement, then you'll have with B2C, which is obviously you're trying to get as many consumers, uh, a vast number of consumers out there. The other thing is, is that um, uh, it can take a lot longer to close a deal. It can take actually between six to nine months to close to de a deal in a B2, uh, B2B engagement. So it's, it's, um, it's gonna be a much more detailed and customized experience for the business if they're selling to another business. They need to be able to tailor their messaging uh, uh, as part of the online engagements. They need to um, identify individual user roles within the businesses that they, that who are their clients. And they're going to be in a, need to um, enable a partner uh, 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 self-service so that uh, the um, their clients can actually uh, identify the resources they need and, and um, uh, select the resources that they need or monitor the services and the accounts that they're using uh, in those types of engagements with greater detail than you'll find in a B2C engagement. Yeah, thanks, Steve. So before moving to Prabhat, I would like to remind, uh, so we are running, we have a couple more minutes for Q&A. So if you have any question, uh, please raise. Uh, so we are happy to take questions. So Prabhat, what would you think, or what's your view on uh, the B2B identity? Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, uh, in my view, it's an emerging area. I mean, uh, uh, most of the new, like the SaaS companies out there, right? So they are providing, uh, uh, so they have tenants, right? So they, they, they are working with their customers, which are businesses themselves, right? So if you build a platform, if you take DevRev, so we are building a platform. So our, our direct customers, the customers of DevRev are the development organizations. WSO2 could be a custom, right? WSO2 as developers, right? So then if you take WSO2 as a customer, so there can be many customers like that. Then WSO2 is building like Ascardio, Corio, right? So then WSO2 onboard their customers, right? So that then when we are looking for a CIM platform, so we look for a CIM platform that can scale and support B2B2C scenarios, right? So I see like most of the like new SaaS companies, SaaS products coming up, the PLG, uh, PLG companies. So they will look for uh, B2B support in B2B, B2B which, which uh, uh, in another way will support B2B2C use cases. Yeah, so that's an emerging area and I think uh, we don't see uh, B2B to C support in uh, uh, many CIM vendors out there, right? So I see some like, I know WSO2 is going to add uh, B2B support, right? Uh, and uh, yes, so that's that's an important area, I think, moving forward. Yeah, so so we, we are lined up number of features to be added on this uh, on the B2B scenarios, especially this is something we learned from listening to our customers because they are the people who came to us and said, we need to support this kind of a requirement instead of saying uh, the B2B identity or B2BC identity. 
Okay, cool. Uh, so let's move into our Q and A sessions. We have a couple of questions. Uh, so let me start with the first one. Uh, should a business organization build a CIM solution or buy it from a well-known vendor? Uh, Steve? Yeah, our research actually shows very clearly uh, that when a CIM solution is purchased in-house, it is far less successful across the board. We saw um, higher rates of security breaches. We saw um, much lower uh, rates of um, uh, 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 the abilities of the platform to achieve uh, uh, KPIs. Uh, for example, um, the number of uh, the number of um, uh, uh, the consumer traffic, the number of sales conversion rates, the number of registrations, uh, consumer retention. So across the board, we, we saw much lower numbers uh, in relation to uh, uh, solutions that were built in house. And the, the thing is, is that the, the, these solutions are not being architected to uh, to meet the broader requirements of consumer identity and access management. Generally speaking, they're being designed in house to, to meet a specific specific set of requirements at that time. They don't address future growth. Uh, whereas solutions that are provided by a solution provider are changing with the times. The other uh, element to this is maintaining the solution over time. Obviously coming from a solution provider, they're taking care of that for you. If you're building it in house, you have to maintain that. So when you <coughs> create updates to the environment, you have to make sure that they are all working successfully. And this creates uh, reliability issues. Yeah. Anything to add, Prabhat? Yeah, I, I would also not recommend like anyone building a CRM solution from scratch, right? But still, uh, there are there can be parts that you need to build on top of uh, the CRM solution. That's totally fine, but not from scratch. Like, so there are core functionalities any CRM solution is supporting. You shouldn't try to reinvent that. And it's really hard to maintain, like if you take OpenID Connect. So there are a lot of like uh, 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 so a lot of RFC is coming up, right? So the security being improved every day. So it's really hard to uh, keep up with those stuff if you try to build it. So you can start with the product, right? It can be a sales product or an on-prem product. And then like build, uh, build stuff specific to your business, right? Uh, on top of that. And uh, one advice there, don't try to be very much coupled into those products, even you extend it. Right. Always don't try to build like ex logic into the extensions of the product itself. Build the logic outside, expose it an API. Then you can write an extension which is specific to that particular product and talk to that API. Okay. Try to decouple your custom logic from the product. Then that helps you to upgrade or, or, or also you will not be logged into that particular vendor. Yeah, cool. I think another aspect that I can think of is uh, you have to think whether you have specialized skills and whether you want to invest yeah. to have a, a dedicated team to maintain because this security related solution, you cannot build once and forget, right? So that's another yeah. thing to add. Yeah, I can give one example, Sagar. So this once again, like while I was at WSO2, I was talking to a customer and, and, and uh, they said, uh, I won't say the name of the vendor. So they have that product on-prem and they have extended product. And like they said, 80% of the code running on that product written by themselves, by, the, by that particular customer themselves. But they had to pay for that particular product. And now they really find it hard to pick a different vendor because they have built their business logic into the product itself. So don't try to do that. So there are extensions of the product, extend the product, but then again, put your business logic outside there either an API or a microservice and just talk to them. Yeah. yeah I think this is a really great answer for me, Prabhat. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Uh, so even though we got a couple of questions, uh, probably for the next time. So I think uh, we had a very uh, insightful and uh, very in detail discussion today around the survey report and uh, and also we covered a lot of uh, other uh, cross-cutting areas related to CIM and the securities um, data breaches and so on. So I would uh, like to thank Steve and also Prabhat uh, joining us today and sharing your expert knowledge with all of us and also a special 
thanks God to those who attend and registered uh, to this session. And also, I just like to remind you that so you will have access to this uh, complimentary report. And I would definitely recommend to take a look and you can understand a lot of things going on with your peer organization. So thanks for your time.